Um, originally, I was just going to discuss uh, WordPress, but after conversation yesterday, it seemed like there was some interest in wikis as well. And we do have quite the explosion on our campus with using these tools, so it's great to highlight both of them. Um, my name is Jessica Vargas. I just started back in January. So um, our team, as you notice, is fairly new. Probably this up. Anyhow, um, so we're fairly new. Um, and what we find is, is that having this youth on this team, we're able to communicate with faculty members and get them interested in what we're doing because they really haven't seen our faces, you know? Um, and so one of the things that we like to do is uh, the CRI, which is a course redesign institute or initiative or of some sort, which is a one week intensive class that has people, you know, redesign a class. Doesn't have to be blended, you know, can be completely like face to face. And so portions of this presentation is the things that they see. Um, so the first thing I always like to talk about is today's learner. Right? <laughs> I have nieces and nephews who will grab an iPad and who can outwiz me. And you're talking about somebody who has a strong background in programming, in graphic design. You know, I have done like every single thing that you can think of, and they can still outwit me on an iPad. So this is pretty much the culture that's changing, right? They're no longer like, what is this chalkboard? Where do I press it to make it work and activate it? And so we need to be more cognizant of the fact that this, this is what's happening to our students. Um, and for a lot of you guys, this is probably already familiar and you already know this, but I like this conk. <laughs> so there's that. So the transitioning classroom. So for the majority of us, we don't really have a true face-to-face -face class anymore. There is at least some sort of repository where you're uploading your documents, your syllabus, some of the files, because you've gone paperless. Or maybe you've even not even done that, you've just done email. You know, talking to your students, communicating with them, meeting them at their level. Um, and so this is pretty much how we see classes now, but we see classes evolving. And so this is what it's beginning to look like. So our face-to-face -face classroom space is dwindling. The virtual space is staying pretty much the same. But we're interested in this 21st century classroom. And that classroom comes with six different little components that um, the Apple classroom of tomorrow has kind of designated. And the reason why I use this is because it creates a dialogue that we can all talk to each other about. We're all on kind of the same baseline skills. Um, but you probably have a different way of speaking this to your faculty members. So the 21st century skills um, outcomes has to do with what business leaders want from their students, uh, from the graduates that come out of these programs. They want people who can problem solve, they have critical thinking skills, they can navigate the web, things like that. Um, revel relevant and applied curriculum. So if you get an English degree, what are you going to do with it? You know, you're given the skill sets that maybe you can go into Orlando Sentinel, which is our local newspaper, and work from there. Um, something that you can walk away with that can translate into a career. Uh, the other thing is informative assessments. Um, no longer is it just, here's my paper, I get a grade. It's a discussion, it's a dialogue. You know, how do I improve? How does this fit into the overall curriculum that I have throughout my entire career at a college? Um, the next one is social and emotional connection, which I think the next two are pretty much, you know, us, the small liberal arts college that's interested in teaching. Um, you know, how do we connect to our students? How do our, our students connect to each other? The culture of creativity and innovation, which, as Anna had highlighted earlier, is what we've kind of hijacked to kind of convince people to try one learning. So, there you go. Um, and then, of course, the 24-7 access to tools and resources, which more or less everyone's been kind of doing. That's probably been the low-hanging low fruit that you can get to. Um, so part of the Apple, um, it's a big, huge PDF that talks about what this classroom looks of tomorrow. And so the thing that kind of highlighted what we're talking about today was that you know, they are talking about the devices that students are using and how common it's becoming. And they're learning to use these things, like blogs and wikis are common modes of um, self-expression. Now, don't mistake this as some sort of idea that students have every instance of knowledge of how to use a blog or how to use a wiki. There's still some times when we have to go into the classroom and we have to have that conversation with the students about like, how do I post something? How do I you know, edit something? How do I add a video? How do I add a video from YouTube? 
So although they know their technologies and that two-year-old can outwit me on my iPad and I can't make my minion jump when I'm trying to play the game and they can, you know, when it comes to blogs and wikis, it's not necessarily that intuitive for them to start. So let's talk about WordPress. Um, WordPress is amazing because it first started off as just a web development tool. You can create a quick website and then you can, you know, post your ideas and your philosophical meanings of life, you know, and, and somebody would pay attention, hopefully. Um, but it's become much more than that. It's got this packaging system that allows you to put in so much different plugins that the faculty members here on this campus have just really taken a hold on to. Um, so the first one I wanted to show was a writing blog. Uh, this is a Dr. Bill's class on writing, and it's just a straightforward blog. And what's great about it is that the students had created themselves their own pseudonym, so they can pretend that they're some, some sort of famous author of some sort. And they can talk about the meaning of life, or they can talk about what's happening culturally. Um, the previous semester, they did it on 80s music, movies and music and all this stuff. This one, they decided to do more cultural things, so it seems more relevant to them. I mean, I was reading posts about Backstreet Boys, and say, which is a little, you know, back in the 90s, but what else? Um, the next one is a photo blog. Um, what we've been seeing is, is that it's not necessarily limited to the classroom itself. It can be for a first year program, which is what this is for. They're attending their classes, they want to articulate this kind of experience that they're having within the college, um, college environment. Uh, there's also an immersion portion of it that goes with it. Uh, I believe they get to go somewhere, some exotic locale, and what does that mean to them? So they're encouraging them to come back and reflect, to take photos of, of, of their experience and craft it into some sort of story about their, their experiences here. Any questions? Yes. So are these uh, hosted on WordPress or self-hosted? Okay, I will get into the implementation, okay. but just as really quickly, um, we host this. Okay. So, yeah. But as you know, like I said earlier, WordPress is not just for blogs. It's for other things too. And this is where like, me as a person who's interested in technology gets really super fascinated because we didn't tell them 100% what to do or how to do it. You know, they had chosen what projects they thought would be kind of relevant. We may have guided those questions along, but this is kind of what they've been thinking. So we have this one particularly um, WordPress site, I'm not gonna call them blogs because some of them are not really blogs, where they were tracking in the 1920s in the progressive era, this is a history blog, about the beautification movement. Um, and so they started posting where they found relevant pieces that came up. So like, uh, although this just shows America, there are some posts that were originally posted from like India. So like they're looking at first document, or first uh, hand documents and trying to locate where they are so that you can get kind of a picture of where these things are popping up and how they're developing over time. Um, the second one is uh, documenting the campus history. This one's not a class bar. This is uh, our archives here at Rollins who decided to, to use WordPress so that they can start talking about the materials that they have in the archives. You know, not everyone goes downstairs and you know, puts on a nice little gloves and say, let me look and see what's going on and what happened in the history of, of bronze. Well, the librarians have decided to take that information to you. And surprisingly enough, people do subscribe to this blog. I was poking around, there's comments, there's feedback, people are, are discussing. And this has been ongoing for a while. Like this isn't just like one semester's worth and then it's done, which we have seen with some of the WordPress sites. Um, the next one is the classroom hub. Now, we offer them Blackboard. Some professors choose not to use that. Instead, they, they find this intuitive for their needs. So what this one is, is a music class. And what was really fascinating about this one is that we talked about it, we set it up, and then she just ran, like completely ran through this. Um, she has YouTube videos on how to like properly sing, how to vocalize, um, your posture, how you're supposed to stand and everything like that. Um, and she's communicating using a blog portion to her students about what to prepare for that next class. Mm -hmm. So this is 24 hour access to information about the class and what they're supposed to be learning, but also it's a communication tool for them to know what's upcoming and how to prepare. Now, <laughs> 
I love this course, and I think this one has caused a lot of, um, not hysteria, <laughs> that wouldn't be the word I would use, um, it's caused quite the buzz. The reason why is because uh, Dr. Russell decided to call it an online textbook. For a lot of people, an online textbook is an ebook. It's something that you can download on your Kindle, something that you can take on your iPad. Um, but instead, she, this class does not have a textbook. There is no book on this topic at all. So instead, she started creating the material, and the material is available on this. Now, the problem that we kind of ran into with this site is that some of the material is coming from the library. Um, and so Dr. Miller was like, hey, can you guys password protect this? And we're like, yes, yes we can. So we were able to just install a plugin and make it so that any student who has a Rollins ID could log into this, but not anybody else. Like if you don't have authentication on our campus, you can't get into this. Um, so that, that kind of alleviated the copyright concerns that we were having with uh, some of the faculty members who were all too free to just throw their stuff up there. Um, but what's really also cool about this course, and which is why it's like kind of got all the components that we were talking about in that 21st century classroom design, is that she is having her students uh, build trailer mashups. Like, you know, she's getting them to work with audio and video and trying to com uh, change the genre of a movie. So something like The Shining becomes a romantic comedy, you know. Um, so it's a really fascinating class, but, you know, students learn how to post in here so that they can have their video. There is a, a, I want to also highlight the fact that there's a plugin that we use for the video because what we also ran into was that originally it was going onto YouTube. And YouTube was like, whoa, copyright infringement, I don't care. Like, it didn't matter that they were doing a commentary, it didn't matter that it fell under fair use, they weren't having it. So, since we have Kaltura on this campus, we were able to install another plugin and it allows students to be upload their files, not really too intensive. Once they knew how to do it, they were able to do it on their own. Let, let me just stop you sure. for one second. It, there is, from my perspective, there is concern about this sort of thing because I don't believe she is doing anything that she could not do in Blackboard. It's true. Mm -hmm. Right? And just like the music, the vocal pedagogy one, I don't think they're doing anything that couldn't be done in Blackboard. Um, and so I have some angst with that because I'm spending people time to take care of this and to help them with this and to work through the fact that they need a Kaltura plug-in with this when they just could have done it in Blackboard and had all of that prepackaged and we would not have had to spend any time. But these faculty believe that there, there's something about this which is better. How much of the navigation can they control in this in ways that's different from what they can do? Now, we could do, we could do this in Blackboard. We could I do think, this in um, So it would look absolutely identical and there would be no difference in these? Or no, no. no. Uh, Blackboard still has a, a problem of grabbing so many different LMSs while it's been on fame and fortune. Yeah. Um, so because it has all these different components, it doesn't work as intuitively as one would right. suspect as a system that gets to be built from the ground. Right. Um, I have been told by faculty members that this is sexy. Blackboard's not sexy. Yeah. Yes. 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 You know. Um, and so the, the, the exciting thing about this blended initiative that we've been having on campus is that we haven't really gotten an opportunity to showcase how Blackboard could really work how it could be designed as a full classroom. I mean, for the most part, faculty members are coming to us and asking us, how do I upload a document? You know, how do I make a quiz happen? They're not talking about crafting a course. Mm -hmm. This is crafting a course. So now that we have the momentum from the day school of, of being able to develop this, we can actually have that conversation. So. Do they, does the professor feel like this is more creative, like for her CV or whatever? Uh -huh. I don't know if it's for her CV. She just, uh, you know, bless her heart, love her to death. She likes to control stuff, and this gives her the ability to be a crazy admin. Let me hit the magic word, control. Yes. Well, I think it, I mean I'm going to try and say this is also like when we turn around and say I'm sorry you can't use Macs because we do PCs here, and that's it's much cheaper for us to support the PCs and standardize. Correct. So I think that's the interesting thing we're all struggling with. Right. As you turn around and say, so how much diversity of tools 
are you going to allow on your campus for people to be comfortable with? Because right. absolutely, this is not the cost-effective approach that more right. people want. But the, the cool thing about working at a social liberal arts college, especially coming from a huge uh, state university system, is that we're a boutique. We offer specialized services to our right. faculty members. You know, And so if Blackboard isn't quite the tool that makes them comfortable, that's OK. We want them to succeed however right. they feel in succeeding. And thankfully, my lady friends over here all have the tools, like we have the expertise to have these conversations with them and get them where they want to be, you know, in a comfortable way so that, you know, okay, so maybe Blackboard wasn't 100% ideal and this works for you, God bless you, go forth and conquer. Like, I mean, you know, like that's what you just do. Go ahead. I'll tell you an interesting story. When we shifted from Blackboard to Moodle, one of the things I did a couple of years later was do a little research about the um, number of courses that were running Blackboard, number of courses on Moodle a couple of years later, just because there was this perception that Moodle was not as easy to use as Blackboard had been from people who had grown up with Blackboard and now had to switch to Moodle. But well, one of the things we discovered was that use had gone up a lot, largely because one of our departments, physics, went from zero Blackboard use to 100 Moodle use because it's open source. Right. They were, they, their, their fundamental philosophy was that physics, physics education should be, we should distribute to the world freely. Right. Um, and hippies. they were unwilling to use, they were unwilling to use Blackboard at all. Um, but the minute we went to Moodle, their entire department went in both feet. All their courses are guest access, open to the world. Um, and so the whole open source thing is, it's, salient, it's a it's part of salient, yeah. what makes WordPress um, enticing as well, is that it's a skill, you know, you right. teach kids how to uh, build build WordPress sites. That's something that they can transfer yeah. right off campus. And so we'll have actually some courses where they, they have a course site, but then they do uh, WordPress sites. The <coughs> students build their own WordPress sites within the course. Okay. The Mac one uses Blackboard too, like you just use this one because you want to the students to be able to create that kind of like the visual of where everything was originally found. But we asked a lot of questions before we just give them a WordPress site. Oh yeah, I forgot that in the slide. Yeah. What kind of questions that guide this kind of discussion? Because um, we're experts, we know what we're doing. <laughs> or at least I like to think so. Um, so before I move on to Vicky's, do we have any other questions with WordPress? Yes. I'm just curious, if the, the plugins that you mentioned, is that uh, it's completely controlled on the back end? The, the engineers Correct. don't have the ability to install uh, If we've identified a faculty member as a power user, then they will have the ability to do it. Otherwise, um, you are basically given an author or subscriber kind of status. And do you have a fixed number of themes that they have access to? So we have designed a couple of themes. I think that that's where we're like really looking to develop a little bit further just to give a little bit more um, customization in terms of that because there's not very many faculty members who are going to install their own theme. They're not going to want to touch it. They just want to look through um, choices and then pick whichever is the most appropriate for them. I think just to add, so we have it on a network. So we turn on, a, like we have like 100 plugins turned on. So an app, a faculty can choose from those plugins, not 100, probably not as much, but can choose from those plugins to turn it on on their site if they want to, right? If they want a, a different plugin that's not already there, then we'll research it and make sure it works, and then we'll, we'll throw it on. As for the design of it, we have a set of themes that are already there. If they don't like any of them, they can go and find a theme that they like, and we'll flip it on for them, because it really doesn't take much on our side to do that. But so it just depends on what they're trying to do. And if they have specialized ideas about what that design looks like, then they come to me and I kind yeah. of. <laughs> yes. Oh, um, do you guys have a thing with like active directory or things like that? Yeah, or? yeah. All these questions are really <laughs> our implementation. But no, no, no. It's cool. It's it's good to understand where the uh, where everyone's having their questions, and then I know how to communicate with them about something like this. But yes, it does. So. Uh, one of the most amazing things about coming here was the fact that it was just one login for everything. Like, what a blessing. Like, wish more schools would do that, for sure. All right, so are we good? 
Okay. Wikis. All right. So um, wikis are pretty much information gathering. You know, that's the basic design of them. Um, you've got a particular topic you want to talk about. Let's put it in a wiki. Let's have students work with each other collaboratively to design their pages, and then maybe they'll edit each other's pages. Um, it depends on how you kind of set that assignment up. So for this one, this one's actually, the reason why I like to showcase this one, even though it looks very simple, is the fact that it's a math course. Um, and as you know, math generally isn't anything that requires writing. Um, but the faculty member felt that there was value in trying to communicate in a written form with his students and get them thinking about math in that kind of, that kind of way. Um, so this one is where they were researching the, uh, the number zero. What does it mean in different cultural contexts? What does it mean in mathematics and things like that? And so we had a couple of sessions where we helped their students um, put the material in the wiki um, and then, you know, so every time they wanted to go back to this, then they came back and asked us to step into the classroom again and just make sure that everybody was able to edit properly. So, um, The next one is a cultural guide. This one comes out of our business um, uh, graduate program. A faculty member takes uh, her group of students overseas, and the whole purpose is for them to learn the cultures, the customs, the traits, as well as communicate with other business leaders in an initial, an international level um, so that they can learn about other companies other than the ones that are homegrown here in the United States. So before she even sends them, she wants to make sure that they have some basic understanding of where they're going to go, so kind of to soften the blow of cultural shock. Um, so every student is given a particular section. Actually, they kind of sign up themselves, and then they build the format in here. Now, the reason that this is really great is that when students go overseas, they just pop open their cell phones and then they can look at the material if they've forgotten something. So they don't necessarily have to rely upon um, going into a system that's closed down, locked down, so that they can get access to the information that they know they've been building all semester. This one um, is another course that gets pretty much all the bells and whistles, and only because this faculty member is using a wiki to pretty much replace his uh, course design as well. Um, so not Blackboard for him, uh, he uses a wiki. He makes it so that his students will note take. So they can take all their notes on here. He wants them to post as many things as they possibly can. He's got it in particular topics, but also he gives the students their own section so that they can kind of keep on track of their own learning. So it's a tool that's 24-7 uh, kind of access that they can reflect upon what they've you know, picked up in class. Plus, there's a really interesting project where they get to design their own island. And what is that island's ecosystem is and how is the environment affected upon it. And um, the students will upload their presentations in here and then they will get to do it in front of class when they're actually in the classroom. Um, and so this ends up getting a lot of information in it and it's very heavily used. So. And, and the interesting thing about this one, this faculty member is uh, one of the most technologically challenged faculty <laughs> members that we have, <laughs> but he truly thinks he's cutting edge because these guys do everything for him. <laughs> right? So he like, you know, he is just on top of it, right? Yeah. Because these guys do everything. So but he actually really I uses this in the class. Yes, he, he does. really does. Yeah. I mean, first thing when he walks in, this thing is open. Yeah. You know, and he's he works in RCFC lab in particular so that students can start, you know, documenting, writing notes. They don't have to go scramble for where they put their notebook the last week. You know, this is their hub. This is their system. Um, as you've noticed with the wikis, they can be customizes too, so if faculty members want us to help customize them, we'll be off of that service as well. Okay, so implementation. Um, yeah, that's true. We can go through the dialogue. Okay, so uh, we were talking about this earlier. What are the list of questions that we ask faculty members? Because obviously, as you all are aware, we want this to be pedagogically sound. We're not looking, just because someone says, hey, WordPress is sexy, doesn't mean that we're going to use WordPress. Or, you know, a wiki sounds like a great idea, let's use that. Well, what do you mean? What are you planning to use it? So here's some of the questions we ask. What are your desired learning outcomes? What are you hoping to get out of this? 
Um, another question, does the content assignment measure um, address the learning outcomes? I mean, we are very big in the pedagogical speak and uh, at times uh, we kind of blur the lines with instructional design and instructional technology here. Um, and so we want to make sure that if they have a particular goal, that it really, that this is really what it's going to do to measure that goal so that students can see that they've achieved it correctly. Um, we're all about making sure everything's very clear and that students know what your expectations are and what they're being asked to do. Um, the next one, is this appropriate, you know? So I've seen people jerry-rigging these systems to try to make it do whatever they think it can do and it's really just not the appropriate tool. So that's another dialogue uh, point for us as well. Um, and the final question, how does this fit into your course? Sometimes faculty members get really excited about these tools and then they don't take anything else out. They put this really heavy project into their course and you know, like the students are overwhelmed. They're like, why are my students not really taking to this? And it's just like, well, did you give them enough time? You know, you're asking them to create video. Some students know how to do that. Some students, you know, turning on the computer is a problem and an issue. So, you know, we have to allow for those kind of appropriate means of training to, to actually occur in the classroom. So as Carrie was saying earlier, all these things live on our social server. So we actually make it so that um, faculty members all across campus can look at whatever is available. Now, like I said, there are certain things that are locked down because of the copyright issues and stuff like that. So if they try to click on there, on those particular links, then um, it would just give them, you have to enter your username and password. Um, and depending on the course, if you're not a student in the course, you can't get into it. If you are, then you can. Um, so we have Rollins blogs, we have Rollins wikis. This is just our splash page for everybody to get into. Um, once a faculty member thinks that they want to use something like this, it's literally an email. Hey Joss, you know, how's it going? Heard about that wiki thing, can, can I use it? You know, and then that starts beginning that dialogue of asking those six questions. And then at that point, if this is deemed the most appropriate tool, we set it up for them. Um, with blogs, we have a list of appropriate plugins that come already with our setup. Um, things like AD that was asked earlier, just because you know we know that that question is just going to happen. Like, how do I log into the blog? You want to make it simple for them. You don't want to add another barrier to it. Um, the wikis don't work on that way, um, just because we haven't gotten there yet with it. But um, we'll see what happens with that one. Uh, we also add a spam thing. Correct. We add an anti-spam thing, um, so because unfortunately the nature of these beasts is that there's crawlers all over the web looking for this content. Lord help me, I don't know why. Um, that just will spam. So you know you've got your Gucci shoes and all the planning arrangements and stuff like that. And faculty members are like garbage, garbage, garbage. So we already put a, a, a plugin that takes care of that. Um, if there are additional plugins that people want to use, like maybe they want to use that Kaltura plugin. You know, maybe they want to have it password protected, then we're able to put those things very easily. And because we've done a lot of the research already, like Carrie says, there's over a hundred plugins we have. It's just a determination of using them. I mean, we even have one that allows you to do a forum. So if you wanted people to discuss amongst each other and not use Blackboard, which could totally do it, we can totally set that up. So. I think that's pretty much it. Any questions? What was the wiki software you used? Uh, we are using MediaWiki, which is Wikipedia's um, built system. And what we've done is, is that uh, we've kind of put a skin on it. Like other developers have created skins for you to apply to them. Um, and so this last semester we were using Blue Spice. We ran into some issues because if you ever use Java, <laughs> you're always going to seem to run into some issues. Um, so we're still on the lookout for figuring out what's the best tool for us, but uh, we've still made, managed to make it work. So your WordPress sites are individual sites, or are you using multi-site? Okay, so, um, thank you. We put it on a network, right? And so what that does is, is that there's one user to rule them all, um, which is managed by us. And then every site that gets created falls underneath, underneath that network. So that list of all the blogs is auto-populated. 
So as soon as you create a new site, it just automatically appears. So you don't have to worry about the listing of all the sites that are available. It just happens. Um, and and then people just end up going to the URL. But is that using, are you using WordPress as multi-sites mm -hmm. or are you have separate instances of nope. WordPress for every person? Okay. Multi-sites. Because mm -hmm. we started with multi-sites and we got hacked so many times really, that we're now creating separate individual sites every time somebody makes a request. We've, we've never been there. And they can do whatever they want, so at that point they, they can do anything. Don't send whatever came your way over to us. I, yeah. Honestly, we really haven't had that issue. What we turned um, off. I mean, you can't really sign up for the, the uh, blogs because of the Active Directory plugin that we use. Probably. Yeah. So I, I wasn't a, really a part of oh, how the, the whole setup. thing was set up on the problems that we had or whatever. So. Yeah, I mean, and then there's also certain plugins you stay away from because they open you up to that as well. So. How, yeah. how recent are you, um, how frequently are you doing upgrades keeping up with WordPress codecs? So um, with WordPress, it just kind of decides to upgrade and this is becoming an issue for us because what we would like to do is have a testing instance so that we can see if the next upgrade won't break every other plugin that we've added to our faculty member sites. Um, so we've been doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. So the individual site that is being uploaded, if it's new, then we don't worry about it. We just start from scratch and if we run into any issues there, then kind of apply it you know, accordingly. But I mean... So you have a choice, right? Correct. Um, on the network sites that you can either upload the, update the whole network or update the individual sites where you, so we, when we do a new site, we'll do the newer update, and then as we add plugins to it, then we will kind of judge, but we, we don't have like a set cycle for WordPress, because it's kind of exploded, right? So we've just been doing one here, one there, and all of a sudden now we have like 100. <laughs> yeah, and you don't even, you don't even know like, what is the rhyme or reason that a site ends up getting used versus a site that got set up but didn't get used? I mean, yeah, it's it's quite immense the amount of usage. Do you all expire happening. sites? Say that again. Do you all expire them if not, they're not being used? Not right now, but we're not starting. Yeah, we have a, a discussion about that as well. We contact the administrators of blogs that haven't been touched by a certain time. Because you know, yeah, we do the cool. very quick and dirty thing where you can. Uh, sorted by, you know, recent updates, and so we just do that. Just but what's really stuff. cool, though, that, and I think that this is what informs our discussion about that here on this campus, is that there are some sites that haven't been used in a year, but they are so fascinating with the material that they compiled for that one instance. So it's still a really good dialogue sure. for us. So I think that that's why it's kind of, we're going to have to, like, pinpoint what we think is important versus, you know. Can they be archived or something? I think yes. They can, can but then they don't want to. Yeah. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. But like, there's one faculty that he collaborates with like seven other faculty, and he does this. It's called Project Mosaic, and he works with all these different faculty. And he really makes the site at the end. It ends up being a static site, mm -hmm. but as it's being created, it's all these. So yeah. And so those definitely doesn't want to take down, even though they're not being updated anymore. Right. You know, but they're still referred to. Yeah. So it's kind of. Like those ones are difficult because they're really using it as a website versus a you know active blog. Mm -hmm. Do you guys use um, Studio Press for themes? That's what we use. They're very, very high quality, terrific. I have Jessica. And you should say that. <laughs> yeah, we use Press seventy five, but it's it's like that. It's where you've got like a mega pack. I, some of those are weird though, because you get these themes that have all these plugins built in, and, and they cost like overwhelming. Yeah, we're, we're talking about we've been playing with this one college one, right? Grand College Design, yeah. where you can pay forty bucks for about it. Yeah, and, and it's and it's basically like if you wanted to create an LMS sort of system, that's mm -hmm. how robust it is. Um, I actually yeah. thought it might work for that other deal, the the um. Sustainability program. Yeah, because then it starts you, you start populating it, and then you just turn on a switch. Yeah, but Vicky's willing to take it into D space. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> We're putting fingers after we spray ourselves. I love it. <laughs> yes, you're sure. yeah, you have, uh, you have faculty requesting like Buddy Press. Yeah. Yes. Side. We've, okay. we've had that. Um, and that was for the general education requirements that were up and coming. They wanted to. 
uh, BuddyPress is another forum uh, uh, plugin that you can in, in integrate into WordPress. So it makes um, it kind of like a social media. Yeah. Uh, right. You sign up students, or people can be users and interact more. And they get their own little like mini sites and mm -hmm. they communicate and stuff. Mm -hmm. 